Thank you very much, thank you. Um, all these bits of paper I've seen have been talking about a smarter city. So I wanted for the next 25 minutes to talk about maybe something which was more soft, maybe the human city. Um, this is a picture from Malmö in Sweden. And maybe you're a bit surprised if there are any foreigners that the Swedes dance tango in public spaces. But this is a sign when you get it right, when you take care of the public space, when you make a nice invitation to people, people do surprising things and behave in different ways. And you'd call this maybe a little bit soft. Maybe soft enough that kids in a newly built housing area sell juice and coffee to strangers, which also tells you that the parents feel it's a safe place. Or maybe eating out is just taking some pizza down to the waterfront and having that kind of holiday feeling on a Tuesday night and being there in the evening sun and enjoying that, that, that sunshine. Or maybe even Viking style, having a dip because there's a platform, there are some steps which allow you to get in and out of the water easily. And can there be anything softer than walking around the neighborhood in your dressing gown? You know, is this a ni the nicest way to meet your neighbors? And maybe what impresses me even more, when people go for their little morning swim in their dressing gown, climbing into the water, they leave the door open, like they were living on a village in the countryside, because the cat, the cat has to come in and out. And in this way, we could maybe say that neighborhood is not just a place, it's also a state of mind. And we have to think about what makes a place, what makes, it, makes us behave in different ways. Now, some of you are thinking, Oh, how very cute, dancing tango, walking around in your dressing gown. We actually have some serious shit to deal with. I think this girl needs no introduction, um, but what she's talking about is actually becoming more and more relevant. These one in 200 year floods are coming every other year. And so climate change is actually beginning to hit us in a serious way, as is this epidemic of obesity, and even in healthy, healthy Scandinavia, we are seeing these patterns of health, which of course is not just about appearance, it affects heart disease, diabetes, very expensive diseases to deal with in a country with a public health system and a welfare state. And in the same way, maybe the most ironic, as we live in cities, that people are more and more lonely, and this epidemic of loneliness is maybe the saddest aspect of city life. And everybody's stuck in traffic. Perhaps there is, we can recognize there's a connection between the planning system, which separates zones into these different functional areas, which is connected to congestion, because we constantly have to travel to get back and forward just to have a functioning normal life. And we can also talk about perhaps, the loneliness, the frustration of these little divorce boxes in the suburbs, living somewhere where you can't just go for a walk to do something nice. And then urbanization, the sexy new smart city. But so many people are rather threatened by that. They don't want a skyscraper at the bottom of their garden. They don't recognize this as being their dream of how they want to live. And I can feel working with the city I'm a practitioner, an architect, a planner, that I'm constantly met, um, both um, with, in the public and private sector, this threat of change. This thing, this climate change thing, this planet thing is really scary. This urbanization, intensification, densification, is actually very scary for a lot of people. And even this thing about being forced to get out of your car and being made to walk, and take a bike. All of this seems kind of like, why am I being forced to do all those things? And I wonder if we can turn it around. And if you go back to this idea of neighborhood, like the neighborhood in Malmö, and actually the neighborhood is about relationship. And I don't know if you can see this is a, a picture of a relationship. It's about people. It's about people connecting to other people, obviously. But it's also it's about a building that connects to a place, to a street to a square, to a park. And also it's about people being outdoors, simply being outdoors, connecting to the planet, 
rather than being an inside in a sealed air-conditioned space, being outside connecting with the planets. We can see a series of relationships about place, people, and planet. And if we can rethink these relationships, that rather than this thing about the planet being a threatening thing, a scary thing, that actually we can be kind of friends with the planet in little baby steps, that urbanization, that actually living locally could be quite an attractive thing if we can have more useful things locally. And even this business of getting about as we, mobility can be connected to social mobility and actually improve our lives. And in that way, for me, it's really interesting to go back to Malmo, where you see this housing district is actually also an in, a social integration project, that it does so much more. It's a health project. It's an economic project. It's an environmental project. And so many things happen when we make places. This man, and I'm guessing everybody's heard of Jan Gale, and it says here, he's actually now 83, the Robin Hood of architecture. Um, Jan Gale was kind of the Greta Thunberg of planning in the 1970s, because he just said, look at the evidence. Look at what's not working. And he wrote, he wrote his theories. He wrote books. and. Jan, Jan's message, I mean, now, I mean, his books, you'll find them all over the world. They're on, uh, on um, planning schools, architecture schools. The idea of life between buildings, cities for people, just recognizing by looking at things. Um, this can be really crucial. Um, and of course, the laboratory that Copenhagen has been over the last 40, 50 years, places like New Haven, which you might have seen on the postcards, it's hard to remember that used to be a car park. And it was actually controversial to take the cars away. 60 cars, 600, uh, 600 parking spaces for cars, 600 parking spaces for people. Um, who buys more, more, more beers, more sweaters? 60 parked cars, 600 people. 1,200 people on a summer's evening. Um, underneath the white umbrellas, you'll see the, the Swedish tourists drinking the expensive Chardonnay. But actually, on the edge, these are Danish people. Um, they, they, they know better. They, they bought a six-pack of beer at the Kupman. And what's very nice is that the, 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 the tourists underneath the white umbrellas, they, 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 want, they, they find it very entertaining to look at real life. And the restaurant owners also know it's more interesting to sit in a restaurant drinking your expensive Chardonnay, looking at fat Danish people drinking beer, than, than looking at a row of Mercedes-Benz and uh, BMWs. People like people. And this is actually about democracy, because it's a, it's a complex ecosystem, a social system, an economic system. We're in the same space under the same sunshine, the same sunset, the same water, the same music, different people can integrate. And simple things, Jan Gill says it's cheap to be nice to people. I would say I have been working with the city almost as long as Jan Gill. In the 1970s, I experimented with prefabricated building systems. Um, and just as an example, this, uh, this, uh, the, this is a building site, but you can see that the public transport is already operational. And all of the parking is off street. And this is, of course, a kind of little icebreaker to tell you myself. I'm David Sim, I'm creative director at Gale. I originally come from Scotland, but I've lived in Scandinavia most of my adult life. The inspiration started here. But maybe when I was six years old, I said the smartest thing I ever said, because my mum was going crazy with all this Lego on the living room floor. And she said, when was this town ever going to be, when are you going to be finished with this town? When are you going to be finished? And I said, it's a city, mum. It will be never finished. It'll never be finished. And this is important because the work we're doing is ongoing. We're never finished. We keep working. And that's a little bit what we do at Gale, at the company Gale, making cities for people in this ongoing process. And as part of that, Jan Gale, um, who's written these books, we've made a new book called Soft City. Um, which the, orig the original working title was The Shit That Works. But uh, the, the American publisher didn't quite like that, so we've called it Building Density for Everyday Life. And this is just some of, for the next 15 minutes, some of the shit that works. And the first thing, we talked about relationships. 
And this first one was about people to place and this idea about could you live locally and what are the building blocks that allow you to do that? And it's this step of the advantages from your front door, the way you connect to your surrounding neighborhood, to all the things that make your life worthwhile. And the idea that you can live and you can sleep with an open window, hear birdsong in the morning, um, your kids can play safely in the backyard without feeling being run over, having f fresh air, um, safety, security, but being 35, 45 seconds away from the bakery and the bus stop. And this convenience of having everything in the same place, but organized in a way which makes it to be convenient to be neighbors. There's a lot to learn from traditional places. I saw in the introduction that kind of like, oh, we've been building cities for the same way for so long, but there's so much to learn from the simple system of starting with a building, which makes a street, which makes a block, which makes a neighborhood. And the way with, with some simple details allows a huge amount of diversity to exist in the same location. A big learning from Copenhagen was the value of the courtyard. By rather having a place to park cars and have the trash, by cleaning up the courtyard, by creating a huge backyard, much bigger than anything you would have in the suburbs, you could actually have a really nice way of life where your children could run around in a big green space. You'd have this sense of identity, building neighborhood, having a space in common. So you're connected to not only the people that live on your street, but also the other street. Meeting in that common space, enjoying the acoustic protection, like I said, sleeping with an open window, having clean air, so you can hang your washing out, your windows don't get dirty, no nanoparticles here. This is just very simple, using the built form. By laying out the buildings to get a courtyard, you get this space for free. A space which is its own microclimate, and whether you're in a hot or a cold microclimate, the patio, the hof, the courtyard always works better to give you a more tempered space. And what we discovered in Copenhagen, this was really great space for families to live in because you had this great big back backyard and you could actually have this quality of family life in an urban context. And this scale is also a scale which we choose because these are all, you've seen these diagrams before in every book about architecture and planning, these are all the same scale, this is the same density. I did the test myself with Lego, so if you imagine 60 meter square blocks, four stories, four, each brick is a story. If you do a bigger block, a bigger shape, you, you need to build higher to fit the bricks in. Same number of bricks, same number of bricks. And I think it's worth doing the test, especially if you're sitting with um, somebody from a, from, from, from a city councillor, a decision maker. High density doesn't have to mean high rise. We choose the scale we build at. And because of this, almost every new development in Denmark is courtyard based. The new housing takes this form because of its social and microclimatic advantages. Other big thing about understanding how we can build, the idea of layering. Rather than stacking like pancakes, layering, just recognizing that the bottom floor is different from the top floor. And it, it sounds so simple, do I need to say this? So many new projects ignore this. The advantage of being able to see in, walk straight in, the fact the ground floor can have a different, bigger dimension than the rest. The fact the top floor can be different, it can have a different shape, a different volume, different light, different inside, outside spaces, and the luxury of living with nobody above you. Um, one of the things we were told that developers said, people don't like to live on the ground floor. You can't sell ground floor apartments. We discovered there's a lot more you can put on the ground floor than just shops. And one of the key things in Copenhagen is if you take care of the edge zone, one and a half meters, two meters at the front, a meter at the back, you, give a, a, you create a little front or back garden, you create a huge value in living in the ground floor. So for families, it's like having your own little house in the middle of the city. And we're seeing now a premium of people paying maybe 20, 25% more just for the privilege of having this ground floor access. It's easy to have your pram, your pet, walk in, walk out. Very, very simple thing, but it makes urban living attractive. And in the same way, it's great to live with this big sky when you've got a, 
there's you know, no tall buildings. I always feel like you know, the tower is like somebody standing up in the cinema, blocking the view, blocking the sky, blocking the sunset. 20, 25% can live in the pent penthouse with that luxury. And we can build buildings which really express these simple things. Shops and restaurants on the ground floor, workspaces maybe in the middle, and real homes on the top. And one of the things, we're, as, as we talk about densifying cities, it doesn't have to be a choice that we have to go from this all the way to this. There is this missing middle, this, this, this scale which allows us a more human scale, which gives us all of these possibilities. And somehow, you know, there's the idea of fulfilling that dream of how do you want to live? And I think that the chance of finding that little front door, the front garden, having a pet, um, your children running out to play, you're more likely to find it in this scale than in this scale. So that was the first big theme, living locally. The next one is about mobility, also social mobility, how we connect people to people in between the buildings. We called it getting about, getting on, getting about is physically getting about, getting on is getting on with your life, but also getting on with other people as you do it. And if we can connect with people as we move around the city. All of these small move, micro movements, and just one thought about time. Time is incredibly democratic. We've all got just 24 hours a day. Um, if you're lucky, you get eight hours sleep. You work at least eight hours, and there's eight hours for everything else. And the significance of this travel time and around the world, we're seeing that more and more people, their lives are being eaten up by travel. It leaves very little, this golden, this golden slice of everything that matters. Having a glass of wine in your backyard, back garden, going to language lessons, reading your favorite book, reading stories to your children. This is, this is the golden section and finding time for those things. And if we can connect the way buildings connect to mobility and think about these very simple things, it takes a second to walk inside and outside on the ground floor. It takes maybe seven seconds to walk from the street to the courtyard. Or with a walk-up height building, 35, 45 seconds to get inside out from the bedroom to the bakery. And these seconds are important. This is when I get really excited. This is Copenhagen, wonderful Copenhagen. This is a time machine. Now it looks just like some concrete. But on side streets in Copenhagen, the, the sidewalk, the pavement now continues across the side street. Cars have to stop. It's a smoother surface. It's a more comfortable walk. It's great for your stroller, a wheelchair, your suitcase and wheels. It gives you dignity, but it saves you time because you don't need to stop at every, at every side street. Your five minute walk becomes a three minute walk. And this gives you, it's three minutes, but it's all the time saving you time. Now, if you have kids in Copenhagen, this means that your eight-year-old can walk to school on their own. They can walk 12 blocks without crossing the street. This maybe gives a family an extra hour, an hour and a half a day. More independent children, but it gives you time. I mean, it's just some concrete slabs. So when we talk, there's no app here. And so just to remember, there are these simple details, instinctive things, no technology, no energy, cheap things we can do which can radically change the way we live in the city. You'll know about the cycling in Copenhagen, just by having this grade separation, it allows all ages, grandma, grandpa, children, even the scary man with sunglasses, everybody can cycle in this simple system. But it's also a soft system because it's easy to stop. Very important from the shopkeepers, you're in the same airspace as the bakery. You can smell the Danish pastry. You can stop instinctively, just hop off your bike. And this actually connects the business of mobility to economy. And actually, we know, because we've counted in Copenhagen and Melbourne and Edinburgh, cyclists spend more than people in cars because they can stop spontaneously. And it's just this interconnection of how we move, how we move about, how it connects us to so like the fact that until the very second before the bus comes here in Hamburg, or maybe you could be drinking your cappuccino or having your beer up till two and a half seconds before the bus comes. So really maximizing the value of every second you have. And I hear a lot of conversations now in the smart cities about TOD. Everything is about transit oriented development. 
Every village in Sweden is building a high-rise tower next to a bus stop. And what this does, it connects you very efficiently to somewhere else. And what's important, can we think rather about neighborhood-oriented transit, connecting you better to where you are, connecting you better to your surroundings, where the buildings connect to the streets. <sighs> Third theme, last theme. There's a, there's a wonderful expression and for the, for, for the non-Scandinavians, um, which in, in, in Swedish and Danish language, which is something like, there's no such thing as bad weather, only the wrong clothes. And this is this idea, can we live with the weather? And I think if you want to understand about climate change, move to Scandinavia, because we have climate change all the time. And it's just this idea, can we become friends with the weather? How do we do that? Are there the small little things, the equivalent of dressing for the weather? Well, we can actually build our own weather. I talked about the courtyard creating a microclimate. The shape of the roof can deflect the wind, let the sun in by having a, a layout of streets which stops the wind. Um, simple things we can do. This is Malmo again. Sunbathing in February. No energy, no app. This is a wall. It's as simple as that. This simple detail completely, it, it means that your life in Malmo is transformed to Saint-Tropez, almost. And in the same way, this is Lund, just down the road in the medieval center. It's so in the, me the they were so smart five, six hundred years ago, building this sun trap in the corner of the square. That be and, the, and the city's now built sun loungers because you can lie in the sun as if you're in the south of France. Even more impressive is even when there's snow on the ground, you can also, this, we can build our own weather. The shape of a window that connects you to the outside, that you can see the, the time of day, the sky, the middle ground, the buildings around you, the lights coming on, the, 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 the leaves and the trees, down to the ground where the life is. The shape of a window can connect you to where you are. And this dimension of this human scale of this three, four, five, six stories allows us to do all of these things with natural light and natural ventilation. Simple technology, open a window, protection from the rain. When you go on a holiday to Barcelona, you'll have seen these amazing shutters. You know, they fold up, there's eight little pieces, the louvers, which you can adjust. One window has 240,000 different permutations for changing the light condition, the ventilation condition, the acoustic condition, 240,000 permutations. It's so instinctive, your granny can use it. You do, again, you don't need an app. Really simple things already exist. And now, as it heats up, now in Switzerland, Germany is creeping up. We need these shutters further north to protect us as climate changes. And the spaces that connect us between inside and out, a very simple one here, this is in France, an extra zone of balcony of loggia. In the winter, it's completely sealed in like a winter garden. In the, in the spring and the autumn, you can open the louvers, and in the summer, you can open up completely again. A reinterpretation of a, of a very simple technology. Finally, from Copenhagen, what do you do about this climate change, this flooding? Rather than investing billions of kroner in, in big concrete uh, pipes under the city, which you use you know, five days a year, much cheaper, to convert hard surfaces into soft surfaces. Have parks, more park space, reduce heat island effect, give public benefit with those valuable tax kroner, and make a floodable space that three days a year, oh, this is what climate change looks like. How nice. But of course, it makes everyday life in the city much better. A cheaper solution, which gives more benefit. And finally, living with the weather, Swedes dancing tango, Swiss people walking around in their swimming costumes. The Swiss capital of Bern, bankers, politicians, watchmakers, in the middle of the day, walking around the city in their swimming costume because they've learned to swim in their river. And in a city which is now getting 40 degree temperatures in the summer like never before, the fact that they have this amazing swimming facility in the middle of the city, and they made it possible by this, concrete steps, with a painted handle, an incredible simple piece of infrastructure which allowed people to use their city in a completely different way. But it also connects them to climate change because what's swimming already, it's really early in the season. 
Yeah, climate change. Oh, wow, the water's really cold for August. Yeah, the glacier's melting in the mountain. So this fun, everyday experience connects people to this bigger picture of what's going on. So soft, these simple, instinctive things. What makes Copenhagen wonderful? Just thinking that people have bikes and prams. In Sao Paulo, it's an invitation to, to sit down in a public space. And just by making this investment in this kind of urban beach, Sao Paulo, which is one of the most dangerous town centers in the world, with unbelievable uh, drug crime. Uh, you've probably heard in, um, in, um, in, in science we talk about um, indicative species. They get very excited when they see a salmon in the River Thames in London because it shows the river's cleaner. If you see a lady with a poodle in Sao Paulo, this tells us it's safe to be downtown. And in the same way children playing, we, did, we, we solved the drug problem. Um, we discovered that by putting play equipment to public spaces, children came, the parents came, the mothers were the best police. Drug sales went drastically down when there were children present. Simple solutions to big problems. Lonely people in New York, a big table in the cafe. People are choosing actively with the invitation to sit at the big table rather than the small tables. It's a choice of being sociable. Or solving crime in Australia, Instead of having police cars stationed in the center of town, here in Melbourne, they have flower kiosks, which are open all night to give a sense of safety and security. The flower man becomes the policeman. So all of this soft stuff, think about this as we make smart cities. And remember what Jan Gale says, it's cheap to be nice to people. Thank you very much. That, 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 that was the cut, that was the calm version. That was that was the, that slow was the calm version. So David, tell me, is soft smart? Well, it could be. It could be. I think what scares me is 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 things become people can get really excited about these sexy words and smart is very sexy. That's why we had to call the book Soft City to have a kind of sexier name for these actually quite boring, banal things. What scares me is I see stuff around the world which is called smart, which may technically be smart, but looks a bit like what in Sweden we had the Million Programme. And there's a risk of just rebuilding this Million Programme all over the world, but calling it smart. The technology is not enough. It's about, it's about this. Yeah. It's about eyes meeting. It's about contacts, about this kind of event, people coming together and recognizing that human beings we haven't changed much, I mean, over thousands of years. We're the same kind of animals. We're essential social animals. And we need, we need this. We need shit that works. We need shit that works. Uh, and, and echoing shit that works, it feels that you're building things that might be echoing a change in how we see uh, people and ourselves, which is mindful in the mm. moment, the tree, the child, mm. uh, the coffee. Is that true? Do you see that, that we're moving towards a less efficient world and a more human-centric world? Well, I think maybe it's different with what, what we call efficient. And I think it's really interesting, like we get talking about efficiency. I work a lot with traffic engineers. And without generalizing too much, almost every traffic engineer I meet is a man who's actually older than me. And as I go older, that, that's scary. <laughs> we're going to go no comment there, yeah? But, um, <laughs> but it's just this thing about what is efficiency. Is mobility efficiency, is about A to B? getting from your house to your desk in a certain number of minutes? Or is it the reality of another efficiency, which actually is doing 20 things on the way? Because it's actually it's A to Z. And I think, without generalizing too much, maybe generally in the world society, women know more about this complexity. There's another kind of efficiency, which is not the simply measured A to B. It's actually the jungling of a, a, a infinite different combinations of things which are possible. So we need to find new ways to measure. Be more, more like a woman. Uh, be more like the woman. Have a more complex efficiencies and recognize that, you know, maybe actually having that cup of coffee right now, being mindful, being in the place now, is actually the most efficient thing to do. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Thank you.